what a pleasure what a pleasure i think at the bbf we have this uh, desire not to live our spirituality our values at work and it seems so difficult at times and now we've got two amazing individuals who have managed to do this not just in any place but in intel we did so we're just delighted to have craig carter and may mozun to be uh, sharing opening some ideas of how they managed to bring this interfaith dialogue uh, projects in their respective uh, departments and intel as such but i have to start with the with the first steps how did you say you know i want to do it to me this is really important i want to kick start because it's not the usual thing that people start in the company so what got you started no it's not that's for sure i started uh boy may you're gonna make me feel old here come on um i started until about 25 years ago this summer and it was about a year or two before i joined the officially chartered um Intel in the mid 90s was chartering lots of different employee groups. It started off with like the women's group, um, the gay and the lesbian group called iGlobe here within Intel. And then I think with the third or fourth one was the Christian group. So it's been around for a couple of decades. So I came on to Intel a year or two after that. So I was not part of the group that actually founded it, but I immediately wanted to start to engage with other people of my religious belief here at work. And so I was engaged in the Arizona community here, oh boy, for probably 20 years or so. And then, um, like a lot of organizations, they asked for a volunteer to lead the global team. Everyone else stepped back, and I was the only one remaining. So, <laughs> so I I took on the the leadership role on the global team um, for the Christian group here at Intel, and that was wonderful. But it was right in the middle of a job transition. I just was hanging on to my job and moving from one role to another. It was rough. I was taking a large um, Intel gives sabbaticals, so an extended vacation time. I was taking that. So new job. And then literally it was um, on a Wednesday when I was working, trying to catch up on my job. And I felt like God was talking to me saying, hey, get to know people of other religious beliefs at Intel. And like any logical human who is busy, I said, no, I'm busy. And he, he kept on my case Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and finally it was on Saturday. And um, again, I'm a Christian background. And I felt like he said, Craig, I've given you a clear and direct order your call. And at that, I was like, you know, I think it's a good idea to be to start to set up some one-on-ones, but I didn't think the atheist group, or I don't think even the Baha'i group existed yet. I can't remember, May. I can't remember if you guys existed yet or not, or the Hindu group or, you know, Sikh group would care to meet with me. And I was absolutely wrong. Um, they were thrilled that someone would ask about their Islamic beliefs. And it just reinforced that, hey, we might have different belief systems, but so glad you're here. So glad you're here. And then the atheist group, he didn't he didn't know what to do with me, and uh, but he loved talking with me. He's like, you're the first person who's ever really reached out to me. I always thought all you religious people kind of kind of didn't like us. Used a stronger word than that, and um, but that kicked off this whole um, um, faith and belief cross faith group. In the, when was that? May twenty nineteen. It was like right before COVID, right in the fall. Oh yeah, that's right. Right fall, before yeah. COVID. And it was it's awesome. I mean, everyone just is alive lights up as we talk and we got to do a couple of face-to-face -face events and then the covid bus hit us all and but it's been growing over the last couple of years it's been absolutely wonderful absolutely one of my thrills in my life and definitely one of the top things in my career um just to meet with may and lots of other leaders um that have very strong religious beliefs very strong and it's just wonderful so and like, kind of taken by what you were mentioning about how eager other people were to yeah. share this, yeah, because I would have thought the same as you, that you, you open up to this and oh, there's going to be partisanship, or oh, you're right, I'm wrong, confrontation, Absolutely. totally different, right? And it's kind of surprisingly, positively surprising, pleasantly surprised to see actually the real nature and spirituality of people um, coming out in such a beautiful way. Now, May, we're very curious to hear your, uh, your beginnings and what got you started. I'm sure Craig had something to do with this. But uh, tell us oh, more. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the Baha'i ERG in just a second, but I got to say the, the way Craig went about doing it is why it was successful. When he met one-on-one -on -one with me, I felt he really cared about me and wanted just to talk with me and learn. It wasn't, I didn't feel like there was an agenda in his mind. And so we became friends first. And I think that was the key. We all became friends first and then we kind of, started thinking, well, what can we do together? 
but the ERG started, Baha'i ERG started right around that time. And it began when I went to a diversity fair that we have at Intel. We used to have it every year before COVID where everybody had a booth out. And I saw all these different religion uh, based ERGs, you know, the, the uh, Muslim, the Christian um, and other ones as well, like parenting ERG. And then there was the um, uh, LGBTQ and there was uh, women's. And so I thought, well, this is a place where the Baha'is should also be. This sounds just up our alley. So I started the process of applying for becoming a Baha a, an uh, employee resource group. And it wasn't easy in the sense that I had to write a charter, I had to write a mission, and then we applied, and then we got rejected. We got rejected because at that time they said there weren't enough people who had signed on or showed an interest. It was just like three people. And so I went back and I thought, okay, what are we going to do? Uh, I wrote to local spiritual assemblies in the cities where, um, where we had campuses, you know, the Baha'i organizations, and looked online. And then I started finding people slowly through connections that way. We got 20 people together. And then we applied again. And we got rejected again. They said because we, they felt that we were part of the Christian group. Uh, they, you know, they didn't uh, realize this in the independent world religion. So what we did is we uh, put together some arguments. We got the letter from Carter and all of these things showing um, about the bicentennial, the birth of um, the hundred years after the birth of Baha'u'llah and Nabab. And, and so we brought in documentation and actually showed, you know, our presence at the UN as a nonprofit. And that got us over the hump and we became an employee resource group. And then that's around when I met with, um, with Craig here. So eventually we had our own booth. Here's our booth. You can see there's a lot of literature at this table. Uh, and we also, I had, we had the, the Baha'i Holy Book, that's the Atlas. We had the Bible and we had the Quran at our table. And so that, that a lot of people, when they saw that, had questions like, how is it all three of them are here? Uh, and then the other literature that you see, and all of it was gone during that, that uh, diversity fair. So just to show that there's that much interest uh, within a corporation to just learn, learn about what's going on and what other people believe in, and, and just uh, maybe be inspired on their own as well. And we wonder, what, how do you choose what was on the desk? What was uh, on there? What do I put here? Is there, oh, was I, there criteria? I, or? <laughs> um, actually, there was no process that said I had to go through uh, anyone to review what I bought. Um, and in fact, they would give me a budget if I wanted to buy these and lay it out because we're providing the information for the employees. I, I didn't submit the receipt. Uh, but what I just did is I went through the various uh, websites and bought whatever I thought I would like to read and is of interest and it just put it there. Um, and as, as I said, it, we ran out. So now, now, again, I have to pick on May a little bit, you know, yes, by her day job is being an attorney here for Intel, but notice what is in the middle of that table. She's a good marketer. It's called food. I believe this food, right? Again, if you ever have a booth, you always have to have food. That's the number one most important draw for most people, actually. It's kind of funny. Hasn't changed since grade school. Yeah, it's interesting that they come for free <laughs> stuff. And, and the buttons were free, too. And those were hot items, too, that just had, they were colorful and interesting, inspirational uh, quotes on them. Beautiful, beautiful. And I love the, the what you've already started to mention is, how this, so you, you have your booths, you have your area, but there's dialogues that are happening. And I wonder how the dialogues actually develop, if they're more spontaneous, if they're organized, how do you start a dialogue? You know, such diversity of uh, points of view. I'd be really intrigued to know how you started these dialogues and, and what happened during the, some of these dialogues. Well, you know, Craig started through one-on-ones and friendships. And then he just set up a meeting and I'll, and I'll let him talk about that whole process. But what caught me is when we had our first meeting, I had met some of those individuals uh, as my first time in that meeting versus Craig already had met with them. But when we met, one of, one of them said, now we got to put some ground rules here. We're not going to fight about this or that. 
And then I rose, I, I said, you know, um, I hope we create an environment where I can ask questions so that I understand you more. And those tough questions are in a safe place so that um, uh, we can work together better. And that just, I felt it changed the atmosphere. It wasn't about I'm right, you're right. It was about just getting to know each other. Oh, what it's been, think, no, you're absolutely right, May. Um, we all came into this with a little bit of, it was new concern. I was concerned. I was like, where, where is this ship even going to land or go? Are we going to hit an iceberg or what? But I think, May, it was like, gosh, was it about a year ago or maybe it was less? It was, um, it's a big learn for me. It's a little story on this. Um, the leader of our Jewish community was just going crazy because he would have hundreds of people come to some of these different Jewish events, but only dozens would sign up to be officially part of the group. And he finally was pinging them, pinging them, pinging them. And, and what he found out was they were scared. They did not want their name on a list that said Jewish employees. They were afraid of literally persecution. They were afraid of losing their jobs, maybe being harassed or much worse than that in Arizona. I mean, and I was like, wow. And so we brought that up in one of our team meetings about the fear that it's within that community at Intel. And it shocked a lot of us. And instantly the reaction was, how can we help? How can we help? How can we help? But then it opened up doors for other, um, I'll call it communities or different belief systems to share, like the atheist system. Um, people from the atheist agnostic group shared about how they're often viewed as having no moral standards whatsoever. So kind of like Hitler. I, I, we were in shock, right? And then we, it went down the list, right? I mean, the different groups would share about. But then I remember May, you had commented on, I, I never would have considered that, thought that, or never would have felt like like the Christians would feel like a minority, because technically they're not. But as a Christian, like I absolutely feel like a minority, and even persecuted and mocked and ridiculed for my belief system. So as we got to share, and as people started to open up, you could imagine what happened to the relationships, right? Tighter and tighter and tighter, and it was just amazing um, to watch this happen. Here's a picture of our team, and you can see all the smiles. Oh, and we had a blast. You get a sense of that tight knit relationship. That video, we did a video in the upper right there, the you know the Zoom thing, and my wife was watching us, and she was just you. You have the goofiest, craziest people. It took us over an hour to record like a two minute video because no one could follow instructions, no one could hide their side. I mean, the signs were sideways or upside down, and. But again, we were laughing and just having a great time. The relationships were just wonderful. But, but then, so, and I'm really feeling that sense of uh, comfort, of uh, I trust this place, I feel comfortable in this place. People are sincerely listening to me in this place. But you also highlighted the fear element, which I think is present in so many people in so many companies. And I wonder, why do you feel... Because the reality is there was no need for fear because there was wide acceptance and things go forward. But nevertheless, I think most of us do have a sense of fear. What do you think are some of the elements that make people fearful of expressing their faith and what would be most important to them? What is your sense? May, why don't you talk first? I talk a lot, so I'm trying right. not to. Well, you know, being different, um, and historically in America, in the United States, there's a division of church and states. So it almost is considered taboo for many people, especially in schools when we grew up to bring up religion or to think, you know, you might want to say a prayer or something. Um, not that you would enforce prayer on others, but it would bring fear to bring the topic up that that's what you did over the weekend. And so I think that's part of it. It's that psyche, that historical, that's ingrained within the culture of the United States. And the other is if there are biases and misconceptions about religious individuals and whether that would affect their work or being mistreated. So those are the fears. Um, and then there is also that component of I'm here at work, I'm doing my work. I'm kind of two people, you know, I'm the work employee person and then I go home and do everything else. Uh, and that concept of having that one and that feeling of being your whole self at work and bring it all together uh, is new 
especially in the realm of religion. It's kind of in the other components that we talked about being a woman and being at work. Those have been uh, some foundation has been built, but um, this one's a new one, but it's time. And I think that's just a great way. It may how you put it like that. It's in other areas. It's, it's been poked on and pushed forward in this area. It's still kind of in its infancy stage and everything. Like a lot of people have just been conditioned. There's work and you go to church, there's work. And then you have your religious beliefs and the two shall not mingle. But like may had said, it is kind of silly. I mean, it's like, I want all of may at work eh, except for that, which she holds really dear and important to her. Please never, ever, ever speak about that. I mean, how can she be even a great full employee when, you know, she's only 85% there. I'm only 85% there. And um, we're very blessed to have a CEO that gets that. Um, he has a very strong um, system of beliefs and religious beliefs. And, and for years, he pushed it down because he was told he had to. And finally, he's like, enough of this. I need to be real. I can't even perform my best um, if I'd have to you know, put my religion in a can um, basically on Monday morning. And I've heard it said, this was actually by someone in politics, actually, some senator that said, if on Monday morning you can just turn off your religious beliefs or faith system, it's a hobby and it's really not a religious belief system then. Because a religious belief system is by definition ingrained in the very fabric of who you are and what is your life. And I, that really hit me. Um, and Intel and other companies, it's not just Intel. I mean, American Airlines or Amazon or other big companies definitely realize this is key, especially in a time when employees are, I mean, employers are desperate to get good employees. They don't want this to be a barrier pushing people away. They want it to be, there'd be no barrier. So they'll get the best employees. Is there something that's unique about Intel? Like, because you mentioned the CEO, no? It's very deep, uh... Uh, wise, uh, positive, spiritual belief that drive him. Do you think it's thanks to him? What are some elements of Intel that make it easier to have these conversations? You also mentioned other companies. And, and by the way, May, it's not just a US thing. It's all over the world. There's this real fear to bring, again, Greg, you say it so beautifully, how senseless is it? You cannot bring your own self and you leave a part of yourself out. And of course, by leaving something out, you're missing out on something. So is there something about the culture in the organization that allows people to do more, to be more of themselves? You feel there's something, I mean, you've been there for 25 years now, which sounds like, yeah, definitely a, a excellent thing because especially in your sector of tech, there's such a huge rotation. So that in itself says something about the company, something about the culture of Intel that helps. What do you think, what's some of the special recipe there? I feel Intel has a true commitment to diversity. I've seen it in other realms. And when it's, when it's not just lip service, then uh, there's opportunity to shine and bring those, um, emphasize those diversities. Uh, for example, in the legal department, we have, um, we have an initiative where all of our um, law firms have to have diversity within their partnership uh, tier. So not just in their employee base, and if they didn't, then by a certain time, we were going to get rid of them and go with another firm that could. And we actually did that. And so we stood behind that. And I see that as well in just the existence of ERGs and councils, which is one tier up, uh, where in the very beginning, even we had the Christian group, which is a religious group. Um, so I think it's that long history of commitment. What do you say, Craig? Yeah, I think that's great, man. I was, um, I, I like to call it my the three R's and the third R is the most important. Um, this sort of thing really helps us with our three R's. It's the recruiting. It helps us recruit the best people, helps us retain the best people, which especially right now is challenging to do. And then results. And we're in the semiconductor industry, the tech industry. So we design little microprocessors that power your laptop, your desktop, the internet, by the way, I have to put a plug in there. And they have like a billion little switches or more. They're hard to design, hard to cool, hard, they're extremely difficult. We need our engineering teams and our teams to hammer on these problems. And there's probably a hundred different ways to solve it. We want nothing to be not spoken. Everyone has to be there. Everyone has to be solving these problems. And it's really challenging. So these faith-based ERGs allow people to not be at 82% of themselves, 100%. Bring it all in. I mean, will you agree with everyone? Just like an engineering problem. Of course not. 
but you want everything out on the table to look at all the different facts and all the data and hold nothing back. And that helps us be a better problem solving company and to get better technology out there. So I think a lot of that just ingrained in our industry and the tech industry has really helped us. We need people to be hundred percent at work. This is tough. It's a tough job um, figuring this stuff out. And the theory of this I heard many times, but <laughs> the practice of it is just like music to my ears. Heis, please, what, uh, looking forward to your question. My name is Heis van Vlier, which is a difficult Dutch name, but I live in uh, close to Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and your conversation and your sharing sort of reminded me of, of my experience. I worked for the World Bank Group for 24 years. And we have similarly, as you know, the World Bank as an international organization is a very diverse, uh, you know, group of people. We come from all walks of life in countries and, and regions and what have you. And, and as such, also from all walks of faith. But there was also the religious clubs. So the, the Catholic club association, the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims society, as well as the various interest groups, whether they wanted to go mountain climbing or fishing. or It, it was always a very formal affair in the beginning. And I think sort of mid towards 2000 or 2002, HR decided, decided, well, now you guys have to set up some charters and, and you know, get approved because, you know, we can't just continue doing it uh, informally the way we did. So I was very, uh, you know, glad to hear about your initiatives and how much more top-down it actually was uh, encouraged and, and sort of implemented. It wasn't always given the attention, I think, that it deserved. And, and I'm very happy to, to see that this is happening in other companies. So thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Reis. And, and, and I think there's one interesting differentiation there is it's, uh, what I'm hearing from Greg and May. It's a very personal it's a very human relationship. There seems to be a level of real deep connection that goes beyond that. That's very interesting. Mahmoud. I, I think Craig referred to the fact that uh, all this diversity in, in the practical life of the company has been very useful, how you get all different uh, uh, aspects into consideration. But what are the topics of those interfaith gatherings? How do you choose them? What are the topics you discuss? I uh, what is the process? Uh, Some of it is events where um, deadlines that are coming up, and that kind of presses the agenda. We had some awards to apply for. There's a conference in D.C. that's coming up. We talk about it. We've also had guest uh, spotlight guest talks where people from different religions, um, the leaders actually, when they come to the meeting, come and describe their religion and what it means to them. Uh, we also put together events like a panel uh, where each religion, uh, religious leader would, uh, or faith leader would talk about that and answer questions from the audience within uh, Intel uh, in a broad, broad perspective. So there were anybody could attend if they wanted to. So those events were often driving the conversations within the meeting. But uniquely what Craig starts the meeting with is, well, How's your day? How are you doing? What's the newest in your life? Um, and so and that takes over half that. the meeting. Huh? It, uh, that takes over half, yeah. And, and it's amazing. Again, it's um, we're all humans on this call. And, and part of being a human is there's stereotypes. We just develop them over time. It's just natural, right? It's a defense mechanism. And people put a lot smarter than me if, you know, did their PhD on this. But as you start to get to know people in the relationships, you go, yeah, I'm concerned about my son in high school or college or this or that, or I don't understand my wife. Oh, wow. You don't understand. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's the relationships. And then from there, like May said, well, what should we do? Oh yeah, we have this award. Oh, we have this panel or, and we started, but then we um, haven't done it maybe as consistent as we should is try to have a spotlight. We have a Sikh spotlight. And then it's a May, I mean, not a May spotlight, it's Baha'i spotlight. Sorry, May. There's other people that are Baha'i that are not called May and or Christian and a spotlight. And then we can ask questions and it's a safe place. Um, and, you know, why do, why do Muslim women wear a head covering? Let's talk about it. Why do the Sikhs um, believe this or believe that? And for a lot of us, it's just a whole new area, which as you talk more, people love to talk about their faith. Um, so that's a great question. 
Um, it's not as structured maybe as we, I think, originally intended, but it's been really neat. And I think that helps as well. Huh? Things emerge as opposed to being pressed on and move forward going forward. Francoise, Francoise is the director of the IFRC, the Red Cross. So she knows something about uh, dealing with global diversity. So very interested to hear about your comments and questions, Francoise. Yeah, it's very challenging to have the diversity um, in practice because de facto um, uh, we try to be neutral in our action but uh, not in our belief. But what is a limit where you present your belief which could put your action not neutral so that is always a challenge for us. Eventually we uh, managed to have a prayer room in our office uh, headquarters and we respect everybody to have access to a, a space where all religions are present. So it's a space for prayer, meditation, not religious uh, room, but really prayer and meditation room. We didn't manage to get groups of religion like that, not, not at this stage, um, but we had more people offering mindfulness or uh, other activity which bring people to uh, meet. And as you say, friendship is a key point. However, it is very much linked to individual. So what's happened if you change work, if you move? And the whole issue of sustainability of this group, because either it is embedded in the DNA of the organization, this diversity as a principle, but this kind of groups can are very much linked to individual motivation. What is your experience about that? So if it's about the ERG, the employee resource group itself, such as the Baha'i or Christian or other ones, there's... There is a board for each one and there's um, elections and the, so there is a, a method to maintain the sustainability in, in that system. There's more than one individual kind of managing and as one person leaves, someone else will be replaced. So there's that historical knowledge. There's a website that we have. We have um, places where we can put our collateral and so that information won't be lost. With respect to the alliance, as we just talked about, it's very personal. Uh, Craig has been great bringing in new people. Uh, even if he, if, let's say, uh, he asked me to be a co-lead so that he can uh, focus on other things within the group. And so since there's seven of us or eight, that uh, hopefully will keep the group going as to what some individual will take the lead to bring in new, in the, new folks. But that is something to think about to make sure how can we make make this sustainable long term, given that it's so personal in nature. And a quick question to interrupt you. There's a lot of hands up, but just one thing is, has the awards pushed it forward to the attention? Because you won the best, one of the best of Fortune 100 companies in terms of interfaith. And I wonder if the awards gave a certain sense of, oh, this is important internally and externally. Do awards have a, a, a absolutely, role? absolutely. I mean, we can all kind of maybe chuckle that oh, it's just a little medal or a certificate or award, but when you win or the, you're the top group, it makes a big deal. And suddenly, especially the HR groups, which this is new to a lot of them, they're like, "Wow, there's an award!" And instantly, I think humans are just competitive. They're like, "Well, we're better than Apple." Yes, you know, as corporation, right? Or or different things like that. Um, there's just the natural human competition. So yes, and it's beautiful to say else. we are more spiritual than Apple. Is that beautiful? Just as a <laughs> well, we just say just better, better, better. Just better. <laughs> which which again, as a lawyer, May's gonna just just not like that. All the lawyers say, but unless you can show per performance, actually, we do have performance benchmarking. It's the award. We do. We yeah, won yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. The data is right. there. We didn't, do, but. Um, I think the potential is there for all companies. So we just, uh, we chuckle, but I, I believe uh, Apple does have, maybe has ERGs and is on their way. But for, for us, that award created a platform. We began having a circuit article. Circuit is an internal intranetwork uh, newsletter or page. Um, everybody, there's a homepage everybody starts off on. 
and you know we tend to have some articles there so it became part of the conversations that definitely helped let's say in the marketing of it and the fact that our hr head and our uh, ceo were behind it uh, was very powerful in that when we wrote an email to to our ceo you know we won um, and he wrote back this is great uh, when my bosses saw that, I think that made an impact when when we when I asked for, say, a day off or go to the conference in D.C. for employee resource groups. They go, yeah, this is very important. You should do that. A comment in front of It's wonderful that you have a dedicated prayer room. Um, and what's amazing that I've seen is even if people don't want to go there or don't, that's not part of their tradition or something, having it makes a statement right? The people's belief system is absolutely welcome here. And um, it's, it's, so it's wonderful that you've done that. That's great. And we have Nan Chen who had a question and then Eugenio has his hands up. So Nan, would you like to start with your question? Actually very interested. And my, my company also is a tech company and very diverse and very inclusive for, for people uh, who has their religious belief, and we also celebrate people uh, or remember people who are uh, in Ramadan, for example, at the moment. And however, sometimes um, it, you don't see also much discussion around uh, a religion, and it actually has also played a very important part of the uh, in, in, in the company as a culture. So uh, I'm trying to start some conversations uh, just just among our, our colleagues and normally we have chit chat on the internet to see their view about uh, the harmony between science and religion because um, we uh, are representatives of a scientific driven or a tech company. So there is very strong correlation between the two aspects, although looks opposing to each other uh, without really understanding and actually intrinsically is very consistent with each other. So I will always, I, I think, find it very fascinating to start a conversation like this. Um, but I, what do you think of such a way of probably helping people to understand or remove these veils uh, for people towards uh, they, they hold probably bias, like you mentioned in the beginning, towards people who are a bit religious in a way. There's different views. For example, the in our group is the atheist group. And so because there's that is a belief as well. And um, I think what what distinguishes all of these is that the these individuals are people who are committed to something and have a strong, uh, compass that directs their life. And that is what makes that person perhaps able to network more or so they're driven and they have a sense of themselves. And so um, science and religion, I think those are great topics. Some people would, uh, would see the connection, some not, but I think it's, it's a very interesting topic to have and conversations to have. What do you think, Craig? Well, I think that's great. And that comes up a lot right? The whole thing on science and stuff, and usually come maybe from the atheist or agnostic community. But how I like to approach it, what even May said is, it's a, it's a worldview. It's a system of beliefs. And I always like to say that, okay, so if there's two people, are they always going to have a consistent worldview and system of beliefs? I've been married for 27 years. I love my wife, and we do not have the same set of opinions on many things. But can we still love each other, accept each other? Do we go through discussions? That's the nice word for it, right? Discussions about different things? Absolutely. So how do you react when someone has a different worldview and perspective? I, of course, believe that science points absolutely to the existence of God. Absolutely. And there's people that absolutely would disagree with me on that. And can we have different viewpoints? Yes. Can we actually care to care for each other, support each other? Yes, we can. Um, and that's how I normally like to approach it versus a more confrontational. Let's just debate it because um, that's been going on for centuries and uh, it doesn't ever end well. It seems like if you get into a debate with someone, does that help you? Beautifully said, beautifully said. Eugenio, adelante. First of all, I'm sorry. My camera is off. Technology has been uh, working against me. This is a beautiful conversation. Uh, my background is uh, Latin America, which... Uh, mostly Christians, and uh, there's Catholic and Christians, so there's no uh, much diversity but opinions, like you uh, said, uh, Greg, about, you know, you, you, you can enter in discussions, but at the end of the things, we believe the same things. 
in principle. Since I don't have this broad experience in, in, in interpreting uh, things, uh, because it's not what I've uh, lived through, can we come to the common causes and not uh, uh, the things that uh, divide us? And, and can we come with a plural understanding of minimal principles? Uh, and, and I think that these minimum principles uh, could be included with the atheist and the scientist, because I think that it is important to highlight what unites us and not what separates us, and, and, and have you deal with that um, topic. But I think you said it. You, I mean, you, you said it right there in summary of, of, of um, gosh, now I'm, you summarize it better than I'm going to try to do that, is basically how do you listen to each other learn from each other, again, developing the relationships um, and, and, and focus on what you have in common. So like May and I have gotten to know each other. May has two boys. We have two boys. She's outnumbered in her household as a lady. My wife's outnumbered. I mean, so instantly we start talking about that kind of stuff and, and kids and that. And as, and as we work with people from around the world, whether we talk about religion or not, we as humans have way more in common than different. And we need to focus on that because then suddenly when you get to the thing you're different in, which every two individuals are going to have, it looks quite small because you've already been focusing on the large, just common being human doing life together. Mahmoud, you're next. Yes. Uh, are there questions or topics that you think it's better to avoid in order not to have uh, confrontation, etc. Or how do you handle this process to make sure that everything goes smoothly? Because obviously, as, as the Okino said, we will try to concentrate on what unites us. And there is a lot. And there is also of the other sort. So what has been your secret, uh, your recipe, in order to make sure that you concentrate mostly on, on those issues that are common? Um, is that basically you, that when you have that, that, that foundation of a relationship, I feel so comfortable. If May said something that hit just a hot button with me, what would I do? I'd exactly say that. Wow, May, I know you didn't mean it. What you said really hurt. And then that would, she'd be, and instantly May would do what? I am so sorry. Can you please tell? I mean, with the Jewish community, Hindu community, because we have that foundation of relationship. But uh, Mahu. Can I, how did you pronounce your name? I want to pronounce it correctly. Mah you did very well. Mah All right. I'll stay with that then. Um, is that there's always, my rule of thumb is there's always like one in 50, one in 40 that just wants to debate. They want to fight. And as we've had these different panels, for example, I was always concerned wearing the Christian hat here is that if there was someone from the Christian group that would just start to just go in, I would, I would, cancel them so fast and say, let's take that offline. That is not appropriate, this and that. And I would be able to do that instead of to stop that kind of a thing, because I want to defend my Jewish friend or, or Muslim friend or this or that. Uh, but I'm ready because there's always going to be someone. Um, I had the opportunity to go with um, a Muslim friend to a Ramadan prayer session and eat dinner with them. First time I've ever done that, there was one guy there who just wanted to start debating with me. How can Christians believe this? How can Christians believe that? Got really uncomfortable for all the Muslims standing around there because they did not like where this guy was going. But again, I, you know, just be quiet, but there's always going to be someone to your point. So you have to be ready um, to stop that conversation before it, it kind of spirals down. Yeah, that's wise. Thank you. You know, interestingly, let's look at it the other way. When there were some conflicts between um, the Israelis and uh, Palestinians, uh, Intel was considering maybe putting a message out. And ah. so what happened is they came to the ERGs and said, well, what do you guys think? And both teams, the Jewish and the Muslim groups, understood that there were these challenges and recommended, you know what, we let's just not say anything. But there wasn't they didn't take sides. The, the groups didn't take sides. They united in providing the best option forward uh, for Intel itself. So they were a resource. Uh, 
so that team, is, because we're all committed for the ability to free, freely express ourselves, that's the top one. We're not there to fight with each other or convert each other. And that comfort then lays the foundation of trust. We trust each other. Well, and actually, even on that, uh, made it, thank you for bringing that up, is that I was talking to it was, a, it was a young Muslim lady who was just ticked off until she pl pull our multi-billion dollar factory out of the country and stuff like that. And so they were going to put out some letters, you know, trying to calm things down. It's like, and they're going to address the Jewish community and the Islamic community in Israel. With this crowd, you kind of know there's probably, a, a, there's, they're missing some groups here. I go, uh, there's a large Baha'i contingent. There's Christianity. Hello. You know, kind of, you know, and, and they're like, oh, this does get complex. So we were able to help them navigate that. And to May's point, the decision was made to, it's better probably not to send out any commission, official communication because there's going to be some group that just doesn't align to it. Yes, yeah, so we were able to help HR and kind of help defuse this whole, which again, in that region of the world, we all know that's been a challenge for a long time. And so interesting, you know, that you also become a source of intelligence, you know, wiseness yeah. to actually improve the rest of the company. Great. Nan, you had uh, a question. No matter which religion that we believe in, and if you, like Bahá'u'lláh also said, uh, if you fall, in, uh, fall into, into arguments and you both are wrong, because truth is just one, so there is no point to, to having any, any arguments upon, uh, among that. Um, and also, I think very importantly that uh, trying to seek consensus and trying to 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 find something which which again unites both parties and and as as the goal. I mean, for example, I came also from a non-religious background. I'm probably only Baha'is in my family as well. And um, at the beginning, I wasn't religious at all, and I, I didn't really think that I would become religious <laughs> uh, in my life. So, uh, however, for example, when you ask the Chinese about, are you, do you believe in God? Or uh, do you think that you're religious? I think 100% of them will say probably no. <laughs> and they don't believe in, in God. Um, how could you actually talk to people uh, like them? And so I think the best way is always to talk about, actually, I also don't believe in the God that you don't believe in. Because they probably have a different view towards God. But actually, fundamentally, when you when you just take the words out of the, the meaning, and then you will see actually the, the the in the deeper level we're connected and we believe in the same God. We just have different names in different cultures or maybe religious um, belief. But actually, fundamentally, it's the same. Um, it's from the same resources. And actually, many Chinese are very religious and very spiritual, and they just believe in this quantum level of of God. Uh, which the Baha'is actually very uh, much believe in, uh, that's an unknown power and in, in the universe. And from the writings, for example, the Confucius and Taoism, and it actually referring to the same resource as um, all the religions are believing as well. So, I mean, don't take the words. So, uh, at, at, uh, I mean, just hold on to those words, but rather seek what is actually the deeper meanings behind those words and which we could seek for consensus and, and agreement with. Beautiful. Nader, Nader, do you have a question or comments? I work with uh, one of the largest uh, engineering firms in the world. And uh, in UK, they really encourage diversity. I mean, they go out of their way to encourage diversity, but it stops at religion. It's got every diversity in mind possible but it stops at religion and i've tried to uh, to speak to two or three people within that uh, group who are leading it and uh, they they it's not just interested they they don't feel that there's any progress in it there will be any progress but i can see you guys such doing such a wonderful job and that attracted so many people but it's just that one step i need to if you can provide guidance further guidance how we can or, well, you reach out to us and we would love to talk to your HR department about it. Um, again, we have a good track record of over two and a half decades, thousands of employees involved globally, international. This is how many incidents we've had due to these religious or faith-based, zero. And we've seen it actually helps diffuse things. 
we had a situation recently where we had a, he was a, it was a Christian ERG member who was again, that one in 50. Yeah. He was probably, wow. He was out there and he was not being the most loving, caring, kind person at all. And so what did we do as leaders in this group? We kind of helped shut that down right behind the scenes and stuff. This is inappropriate behavior, had some very strong talks and it, it helps defuse situations. And we, I've seen that in different communities. No one wants that, you know, that one in 50 to make their entire group look bad. Um, and so they kind of, they self-police in a way. It sounds kind of strong. They self-police and it becomes a better environment. But I think to compete, you have to do this. Yes. I mean, your engineering company, I, if, if it's like any other big company in the world is struggling to retain, well, recruit and retain employees. And if your competitor ha- allows people to bring their whole self to work, where, where are they going? They're going to get the better people. Um, yeah. Reach out to us. Thank you. Yeah, you know, you. Um, there are awards being given to companies, high company, you just saw the list. So um, there's al- already precedence that uh, evidences that companies are looking at this, that uh, they are valuing it, and that uh, they're being recognized for it, and they're taking intense steps to do it. So let me just touch a little bit on why now, and why why it could be different today if you ask the same question from HR. In the past, diversity was focused on what was physically visible. So maybe it was um, a a physical disability or it was a color of your skin or you're a woman. That is now changing within the industry to look also at what is not readily visible. That could be your religion, it could be your sexual orientation, Uh, and other things as well, Uh, neurodiversity, you know? And these are now being being, uh, considered and valued. And so how does a a company, you know, how can you quantify a a religion helping a company? Well, um, when you can take your days off because of religious purposes, when you are fasting, maybe your boss doesn't uh, organize a lunch sure. event and provide you know, a lavish banquet, but does it in the evening instead. There's a recognition of that individual and they feel like they're, part, they're truly part of the group. They're no longer faking a presence. They're not acting like someone else to fit in. Then it builds loyalty. I can, I can give you an example uh, and these are, this is one of the main reasons why I feel like I'd like to stay at Intel. And that is just recently, I got FMLA leave to assist my mother, who's uh, higher in age, to go on a pilgrimage to Haifa, Israel. Now, I did have to push her wheelchair. There was a medical reason for it. But my boss didn't ask about, well, how come that's not surgery? You know, it was it was understood that that's something of value to my mother and she needs assistance just as she would if she needed to go to a doctor. So when when those when I'm appreciated that way, you know, it's not just money that you give to your to your employees that helps them drive to work harder. It's it's being seen and appreciated. And with that note, I think we can close uh, this very, very special uh, 60 minutes that you gifted us. Your, your agendas are crazy. I don't know where you found the time. But if I have to describe two leaders, I would describe May and Craig. Because you really bring in not just your full self, but allowing others to do exactly the same. In a respect, in a listening, in a curiosity mode that makes everything so much easier. So I really congratulate you two personally, individually for how you are, how you bring your full self and you allow others to do the same. And thank you in general for this hour that you spent. Mahmoud, as a last point. Of all the beautiful things we heard tonight, the last sentence by May and Craig, for me, were the most powerful. You are not only doing it for your own good, but you are ready to go out, help others, not only other people, but other companies. This is the spirit that we need today to have a transformed world tomorrow. Thank you.